starting with this video, it would be good to look at the Interstate Compact for Mutual Military Aid in an Emergency, which was taken from the Connecticut Code, as all states have their, quote, civil codes, which surprisingly govern criminal statutes as well. The federal government has the United States Code. So this is the code for the state of Connecticut, but I'm sure you'll find this compact in other places and in other states. In Article 1, it states, the purpose of this compact, purposes of this compact are, to provide for military mutual aid and assistance in an emergency for by the military forces of a signatory state to the military forces of the other signatory states or of the United States, including among other military missions, the protection of interstate bridges, tunnels, ferries, pipelines, communications facilities, and other vital installations, plants and facilities, and the military support of civil defense agencies. Notice that military support of civil defense agency. To provide for the fresh pursuit case of an emergency by the military forces or any part or member thereof of a signatory state into another state of insurrectionists, saboteurs, enemies or enemy forces or persons seeking or appearing to seek to overthrow the government of the United States or of a signatory state. All of this sounds fairly straightforward, correct? Well, just just wait. <laughs> to make provisions for the powers, duties, rights, privileges, and immunities of the members of the military forces of a signatory state while so engaged outside of their own state. An emergency, as used in this compact, shall mean and include invasion or other hostile action, disaster, insurrection, or imminent danger thereof. State, as used in this compact, shall include any signatory state. Military forces, as used in this compact, shall include the organized militia, or any force thereof, of a signatory state. So let's look further. Under Article 4, it shall be the duty of each signatory state to integrate its plan for the employment of its military forces in case of emergency with the joint plans recommended by the committee for mutual military aid and with the emergency plans of the armed forces of the United States. Now notice two things here. Armed forces of the United States is lowercase. They don't do that by accident. And the Committee for Mutual Military Aid is a hallmark of these corrupt bureaucrats. They love their committees and their subcommittees. It gives the perception that there's more of them than there actually are. In case of emergency, upon the request of the governor of a signatory state, the governor of each signatory state, to the extent consistent with needs of his own state, shall order its military forces or such part thereof as he, in his discretion, may find necessary to assist the military forces of the requesting state in order to carry out the pr purposes set forth in this compact. In such case, it shall be the duty of the governor of each signatory state receiving such a request to issue the necessary orders for such use of the military forces of his state without the borders of his state and to direct the commander of such forces to place them under the operational control of the commander of the forces of the requesting state or of the United States which may be engaged in meeting the emergency. The governor of any signatory state in his discretion may recall the military forces of his state serving without its borders or any part or any member of such forces. Article 5. In case of an emergency, any unit or member of the military forces of signatory state which has been ordered into active service by the governor may upon order of the officer in immediate command thereof continue beyond the borders of his own state into another signatory state in fresh pursuit of insurrectionists, saboteurs, enemies, or enemy forces, or persons seeking or appearing to seek to overthrow the government of the United States or of any of the signatory states until they are apprehended by such unit or member. 
Any such person who shall be apprehended or captured in a signatory state by unit or member of the military forces of another signatory state shall without unnecessary delay be surrendered to the military or police forces of the state in which he is taken or to the forces of the United States. Such surrender shall not constitute a waiver by the state of the military forces making a capture of its right to extradite or prosecute such persons for any crime committed in that state. Article 6. Whenever the military forces or, uh, or any part thereof of any signatory state are engaged outside of their own state in carrying out the purposes of this compact, the individual members of such military forces so engaged shall not be liable civilly or criminally for any act or acts done by them in the performance of their duty. Well, there's other ways that people can be held liable. <laughs> The individual members of such forces shall have the same powers, duties, rights, privileges, and immunities as the members of the military forces of the state in which they are engaged. But in any event, each signatory state shall save harmless any member of its military forces wherever serving and any member of the military forces of any other signatory state serving within its borders for any act or acts done by them in the performance of their duty while engaged in carrying out the purposes of this, purposes of this compact. Article 7. Each signatory state shall provide in the same amounts and manner as if they were on duty within their own state for the pay and allowances of the personnel of its military forces, and for the medical and hospital expenses, disability and death benefits, pensions and funeral expenses of wounded, injured, or sick personnel, and of dependents or representatives of deceased personnel of its military forces, in case that such personnel shall suffer wounds, injuries, disease, disability, or death while engaged with it without the state pursuant to this compact and while going to and returning from such other signatory state. Each signatory state shall provide in the same amounts and manner as if they were on duty within their own state for the logistical support and for other costs and expenses of its military forces while engaged without the state pursuant to this compact and while going to and returning from such other signatory state. Any signatory state rendering outside aid in case of insurrection or disaster, not the result of invasion or hostile action, shall if so elects be reimbursed by the signatory state receiving such aid for the pay and allowances of its personnel, logistical support, and all other costs and expenses referred to in Section 1 of this article and incurred in connection with the request for aid. Such election shall be exercised by the governor of the aiding state presenting to the governor of the requesting state. Article 8. Nothing in this compact shall be construed to limit or restrict the power of any signatory state in case of an emergency affecting that state only to provide for the internal defense of any part of the territory of said state for the protection and control of any bridge, tunnel, ferry, installation, plant, or facility, or any part thereof within the borders of such state, or to prohibit the enforcement of any laws, rules, and regulations, or the execution of any plan with regard thereto. Article 9. This compact shall continue in force and remain binding on each signatory state until the legislature or the governor of such state gives notice of withdrawal therefrom. Such notice of withdrawal shall not be effective until six months after said notice has been given to the governor of each of the signatory states. New England Disaster Training Center Activity Account This is established an account to be known as the New England Disaster Training Center Activity Account, which shall be separate, non-lapsing account within the general fund. The account shall contain any monies required by law to be deposited into the account and any monies obtained from the proceeds of operational activities of the New England Disaster Training Center. Monies in the account shall be expended by the Adjutant General for the purpose of operating the New England Disaster Training Center. The Adjutant General may apply for and accept gifts, grants, and donations from public or private sources for the purpose of said account, and any such gifts, grants, or donations shall be deposited in said account. Now, we go to the state of Washington in the Washington Intrastate Mutual Aid System, or WAMAS. Washington Intrastate Mutual Aid System is enabling legislation allowing member jurisdictions throughout Washington state to efficiently and effectively share resources during disasters or emergencies, as well as anticipated drills or exercises. WAMAS is formalized into law, RCW 38.56, for jurisdictions below the state level and requires two member signatories to utilize. The WAMS members are from every county, city, and town of the state, does not include special purpose districts or state agencies. 
Federally recognized Indian tribes located within the boundary of the state may become a member upon receipt by the Washington State Military Department of a tribal government resolution declaring its intention to be a member of the WAMAS. The Pacific Northwest Emergency Management Arrangement, PNEMA. Pacific Northwest Emergency Management Arrangement provides international, notice that word, international mutual aid. PNEMA is an interjurisdictional agreement that enables entities to provide mutual assistance and the sharing of resources during times of need and for cooperative activities to improve civil preparedness and response across jurisdictional boundaries. PNEMA is governed by public law, which is code, obviously, uh, fraudulent Congress, and does not require a governor's pro proclamation before use. The members of PNEMA include the states of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Alaska, and the province of British Columbia and the Yukon Territory. If a jurisdiction owns a resource, equipment, or personnel, which could be considered for deployment under the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, EMAC, an intergovernmental, interlocal agreement, IGA, needs to be executed between the Washington Military Department and the jurisdiction to establish terms and conditions and eligibility for allowable expenditure reimbursement. If assistance is requested of Washington State and a jurisdiction has the requested resource available, the IGA will be amended with the deployment, specific resources, and estimated costs. Once the costs are accepted by the requesting state and the amendment fully executed, a mission order will be issued to the offering jurisdiction and deployment will be authorized. National Center for Interstate Compacts, the Council of State Governments. National Guard Mutual Assistance Compact. Provides for mutual aid in using the National Guard for emergencies, flexibility and deployment of National Guard forces. Now notice that word National Guard guarding the juridic nation, of course. Maximum effectiveness of the National Guard when utilized under the compact and protection of Guard personnel when serving in other states on emergency duty. The compact is similar to the Mutual Military Aid Compact. It is, was drafted and approved by the Midwestern and Southern Governors Conferences in 1967. That would be a very interesting conference to look into. All states are eligible to participate. The following states were originally reported to have ratified the compact. Alabama, 1969. Alaska, 1968. Kansas, 1968. North Carolina, 1969. South Dakota, 1969. And Virginia, 1968. This compact may have been superseded by the EMAC. That's the Emergency uh, Mutual Aid Compact. The Emergency Management Assistance Compact, EMAC. That's what it stands for. <laughs> An overview. The Emergency Management Assistance Compact, EMAC, is an agreement among member states to provide assistance after disasters overwhelm a state's capacity to manage consequences. The compact, initiated by the states and coordinated by the National Emergency Management Association, notice that word there, association, provides a structure for requesting emergency assistance from party states. In 1996, Congress approved EMAC as an interstate compact. EMAC also resolved some, but not all, potential legal and administrative obstacles that may hinder such assistance to the state level. Now, I imagine one of those obstacles is the U.S. Constitution. That would probably be one of their obstacles. And naturally, the citizenry and armed populace. That's one of the obstacles they also have to um, eliminate. EMAC also enhances state preparedness for terrorist attacks. That's probably the uh, families that don't like having quote-unquote critical race theory and being forced on their children. By ensuring the availability of resources for fast response and facilitating multi-state cooperation and training activities and preparedness exercises. In June of 2008, a bill to reform mutual aid agreements for the National Capital Region was enacted to expand the types of organizations and agencies in the region that are authorized to enter into agreements and ease the requirements for agents and volunteers to respond to an incident. So they're easing the requirements. Would require EMAC to ensure that licensed mental health professionals with expertise in treating vulnerable populations 
are included in the leadership of the National Disaster Medical System and are available for deployment with disaster medical assistance teams. This report will be updated as events warrant. This report is an updated update based upon a previous report written by Keith Bay, a specialist in American national government. Now, naturally, we have seen the implications of that particular part in uh, recent years. Now, back to Washington, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. Emer <coughs> Emergency Management Assistance Compact, EMAC, provides an interstate mutual aid. EMAC is a national governor's interstate mutual aid compact that facilitates the sharing of resources, personnel, and equipment across state lines during times of disaster and emergency. EMAC is formalized into law and requires a governor's pro proclamation before use. The members of EMAC include all 50 states, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, and the District of Columbia. So, <clears throat> to put all of this into perspective, let's go back to the Connecticut Code, Chapter 504, Militia. And this code is still in force, mind you. Components. Persons subject to military duty. All male citizens and all male residents of the state who have declared their intention to become citizens of the United States. Let's read that line again. All male citizens and all male residents, all male citizens and all male residents does not specify fighting capability of the state who have declared their intention. So they're not U.S. citizens. All you have to do is declare your intention to become citizens of the United States. Take of that what you will. Between the ages of 18 and 45 years, not exempt by law, shall be subject to military duty and designated as the militia. All female citizens and all female residents of the state who have declared their intention to become citizens of the United States between the ages of 18 and 45 years may enlist voluntarily in any women's unit of the armed forces of the state. Classes of militia. The militia shall be divided into four classes as follows. The unorganized militia, the organized militia, the national guard, and the naval militia. The national guard for the purposes of this chapter shall consist of the national guard and the air national guard. The unorganized militia shall consist of all male citizens and all male residents of the state who have declared their intention, again, to become citizens of the United States between the ages of 18 and 45 years, not exempt from military duty by federal or state laws, or by such reasons of physical or mental disabilities as shall be prescribed in general orders or regulations published by the adjutant general and approved by the governor and who are not members of the organized militia or of the national guard or of the naval militia and all female citizens and all female residents of the state who have declared their intention to become citizens of the united states between ages of 18 and 45 years who may voluntarily offer their services to the state okay so you kind of did mention the disability thing Anyway, the organized militia shall consist of the governor's guards, the state guard. Notice that. They have a unit specifically type called the governor's guards and a state guard. And such other military forces as may be designated by the governor as commander in chief, which may hereafter be organized under the provisions of the laws of the state. The National Guard shall consist of such forces as may be organized and maintained by this state pursuant to the laws and regulations of the United States relating to the National Guard. The Naval Militia shall consist of such persons as may enlist or be appointed or commissioned therein as a special force for coast protection and as a Naval Reserve and shall be organized and maintained by the state pursuant to the laws and regulations of the United States relating to the Naval Militia and may include a Marine Corps branch of the Naval Militia subordinate thereto in all matters pertaining to command, discipline, or administration. The Organized Militia, the National Guard, the Naval Militia, and Marine Corps branch of the Naval Militia, where, whenever organized, shall be for all purposes under the general statutes the armed forces of the state. Now isn't that interesting? Now notice none of these things are recognizing the quote supreme law of land, the U.S. Constitution. No, the majority of these things are in violation of the Constitution. So let's read further. Militia and National Guard deemed law enforcement agencies for certain purposes. 
The organized militia or National Guard is deemed to be a law enforcement agency solely for the purpose of participation in any federal asset forfeiture or military surplus programs. Now, considering these people are deeming them to be law enforcement, you can imagine that their so-called federal asset forfeiture will also be deemed by them and the military surplus program. Of course, in coordination with all of the other corrupt state governments. Well, state entities that pretend to be governments. They're not governments. They're uh, oppressing the people under the color of law, essentially. Everything that the Constitution is supposed to prohibit. Anyway, National Guard, Naval Militia, Equipment, and Location. In time of peace, the number of enlisted personnel and the number of officers in the National Guard shall be not less than the minimum required by the laws of the United States. Now, naturally, they don't specify which laws those are. The National Guard and Naval Militia shall be organized, uniformed, armed, equipped, trained, and disciplined as required by the laws and regulations of the United States relating to the National Guard and Naval Militia. The various organizations and units of the National Guard and Naval Militia shall be located throughout the state with reference to the military wants thereof, means of concentration, and other military requirements. The governor may, in case of war, invasion, insurrection, riot, or imminent danger thereof, increase said force and organize the same according to the laws of the United States. Now again, that's not the Constitution. It's quote, the laws of the United States. Now notice that last part. A company formed by voluntary enlistment may be sued and held liable as a voluntary association. Part 2. Command and Military Department Governor to be Commander-in-Chief, the Governor shall be the Captain General and as such Commander-in-Chief of the Militia, and of the National Guard and the Naval Militia, not in the service of the United States and may employ it or any part of it for the defense or relief of the state or any part of inhabitants or territory and shall have all the powers necessary to carry into effect the provisions of this chapter. Now notice we went back to the, we started with the compacts, which take this whole thing about using it only for the state and project it onto all other states. So it's a sort of checks and balances against the citizenry of the United States specifically the armed component of the citizenry, of course. He shall issue all orders and prescribe all regulations for the organization and government of the organized militia. Notice that. Organization and government of the organized militia. Isn't that interesting? The National Guard and the Naval Militia. Such orders and regulations shall not be in conflict with the laws and regulations of the United States. Now, they're in the conflict with the Constitution, of course, but they're not talking about that. He shall issue all orders and regulations necessary to cause the National Guard and Naval Militia to conform at all times to the laws and regulations of the United States relating thereto. Governor's Military Staff The Governor shall appoint the military staff that shall consist of the Adjutant General, who shall be Chief of Staff with the rank of Lieutenant General, the Assistant Adjutant Generals, one of whom shall serve as Deputy Chief of Staff as provided under subsection C of section 27-24 the Chief of Staff for the Connecticut Air National Guard, an Air Aide-de-Camp with the rank of Colonel, well, Aide-de-Camp, it's, it's French, who shall be the Senior Aviation Officer of the Connecticut National Guard, a Surgeon General who shall be Senior Medical Officer of the National Guard, one Aide-de-Camp with the rank of Colonel from the United States Air Force Reserve, one Aide-de-Camp with the rank of Captain from the United States Naval Reserve, one aide de comp with the rank of colonel from the United States Marine Corps Reserve, one aide de comp with the rank of colonel from the United States Army Reserve, one aide de comp with the rank of lieutenant commander from the United States Coast Guard Reserve, five aide de comps, two with the rank of colonel, two with the rank of lieutenant colonel, and one with the rank of major, all of whom shall be from National Guard, and two enlisted aides de comp with the rank of sergeant major from the National Guard. Members appointed from the armed forces of the state shall retain their federal or state grades and shall remain subject to duty therein. And if appointed to such staff in a rank lower than the highest grade attained in federal or state service, shall serve in the state in their highest recognized grade. Any requirement of this section that any members of the governor military staff shall be a member of or hold any rank in the National Guard shall be inapplicable whenever the National Guard is in active service with the Army, Navy, or Air Force of the United States and at such time the military staff of the governor may be appointed by the governor from the organized or unorganized militia, ex-members of the United States Army or Navy, 
or the Connecticut National Guard, or from civil life, and in addition to the active military staff, the governor may, at said governor's discretion, appoint honorary staff members from the former National Guard or Navy militia, then on active military duty. The governor at any time, at any other time, may appoint honorary staff members to the Connecticut National Guard without regard to affiliation who shall serve without the pay, honors, privileges, and benefits afforded the active staff members, including but not limited to allowances and tuition waivers. The major's commandant of the first and second companies, governor's foot guards and the governor's horse guards, shall be ex officio members of the governor's military staff. The governor shall also appoint the immediate predecessors of such major's commandant to serve as additional ex officio members. In addition to the above named officers, the governor shall appoint three additional staff members, one of whom shall be a colonel or of equivalent naval rank, and two of them shall be majors or of equivalent naval rank. Now, ex officio is like ex post facto. It's after the fact is ex post facto. Ex officio is like not officially, basically. History PA authorized governors to appoint honorary staff members to the Connecticut National Guard, substituted military staff for staff provided, blah, blah, blah. Authority of governor service outside state. In time of war, invasion, rebellion, right, or disaster, or reasonable apprehension thereof, or upon requisition by the President of the United States, the governor shall order out for active service such portion of the militia as he deems necessary. Whenever it is necessary in case of invasion, disaster, insurrection, right, or breach of the peace, or imminent danger thereof, the governor may direct the members of the unorganized militia, or such of them may as may be necessary to be drafted under such regulations as he may prescribe into the active service of the state to serve as directed by him the governor may order the organized militia or any part thereof to serve outside the borders of the state in order to perform military duty of every description and to participate in parades reviews cruises conferences encampments maneuvers or other training and to participate in small arms and other military competitions and to attend service schools now notice they are operating under the guise of the constitution by using wording that they derive from the constitution hence the point of the or unorganized and organized militia but well, i'll get into the specifications of that in a minute Armed forces may be called in case of a riot. In case of a riot or civil commotion in any place in this state, any official whose duty it is to enforce the civil authority at such place may, if he considers that the force at his disposal is not sufficient, inform the governor who may order out such portion of the armed forces of the state as he thinks advisable and may direct the commanding officer of the force selected to communicate with the persons making application to assist such person in preserving the peace and to use such portion of his force as may be necessary therefore. Calling out troops without governor's order. Whenever any civil officer whose duty it is to enforce the civil authority in any place in this state finds it impossible to communicate immediately with the governor and deems the danger too admit, imminent to admit of delay, he may take written make written requisition for assistance containing a statement that he is unable to communicate with the governor upon the senior officer of any part of the organized militia or national guard located in his town city or county and such commanding officer is authorized thereupon to exercise with respect to calling out of the troops under his command the powers conferred by law upon the governor until he receives instructions or orders from the governor now, what they're basically talking about here is what's considered a militia marshal, somebody who marshals the forces of the militia. But what they're doing is that they're putting this in a very specific top-down control that was not intended by the Constitution, obviously. And this is so that they can, acting under the color of the Constitution, can wield the weapon of the militia against the people of the United States. And so much is so obvious in the rest of the documents that we will continue forward in reading. Military Department Adjutant General Appointment Qualifications The Military Department shall be comprised of 1. The Armed Forces of the State, as defined in Section 27-2, which shall be under the military command and control of the Adjutant General and the Department's civilian employees. The Military Department shall be under the command and control of the Adjutant General on or before July 1, 1980. 
the governor shall appoint an adjutant general with the rank of major general to serve for two a term of two years from July 1st, 1980. Quadrennially, quadrennially thereafter, the governor shall appoint an adjutant general with the rank of lieutenant general to serve for a term of four years from such first day of July and until a successor is appointed and qualified. The adjutant general shall have at least 15 years commissioned service in the armed forces of the United States, at least 10 years of which shall have been served in the National Guard and shall have obtained the minimum officer grade of 05. That is officer rank of OFAR, that five, that's a commissioned officer. And uh, it's got a specific designator title in every branch. Now I think it might be the same for every branch, actually. Uh, in the Marine Corps, at least. O1 to O2 are lieutenants, first and second. Then after that you have captain, and then you have major and lieutenant colonel. I might remember that wrong. Anyway, no person shall be appointed or continue to serve as adjutant general after reaching the age of 64 years. The adjutant general may be suspended or removed by the governor in accordance with the provisions. Military department to be within department of inter Now notice this part right here. Military department to be within Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection for administrative purposes only. What that means is that they encapsulate or hide their military department within the Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection. Those are your public protection safety or public safety facilities, as we referenced in the earlier video that I published. which was uh, about the particular crimes of Karen. <laughs> and this tells you exactly how they have sort of encapsulated this stuff and operated with under everyone's nose, basically, without anyone really noticing. Military Department's State Morale Welf Welfare and Recreation Account Annual Report to Secretary of the Office of Policy and Management. There is established an account to be known as the Military Department State Morale, Welfare, and Recreation Account, which shall be a separate, non-lapsing account within the general fund. Notice that, within the general fund. That doesn't mean general fund as in nondescript fund. That means the general fund as in the fund to be used by the general against the people. We the people. The account shall contain any monies required by law to be deposited into the account which shall include but not be limited to proceeds of state military morale, welfare, and recreation programs and gifts, grants, and donations from public or private sources. I expect most of those public and private sources wind back to the UN and through uh, Bank of England and so on and so forth. Monies in the account shall be expended by the Adjutant General for the purposes of operating state military morale, welfare, and recreation programs not later than August 1st, 2022, and annually thereafter, the Adjutant General shall submit a report to the Secretary of the Office of Policy and Management concerning deposits into and expenditures from the account for the previous fiscal year. Chargeable Transient Quarters and Billeting Account There is established an account to be known as the Chargeable Transient Quarters and Billeting Account, which shall be a separate non-lapsing account within the general fund, the account shall contain any monies required by law to be deposited into the account, which shall include but not be limited to proceeds of room service charges at Camp Net at Neontic. Monies in the account shall be expended by the Adjutant General for the purposes of billeting members of the armed forces at Camp Net at Neontic. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Governor's Guards Account there is established an account to be known as the Governor's Guards Account, which shall be a separate, non-lapsing account within the General Fund. The account shall contain any monies required by law to be deposited in the account, which shall include but not be limited to the proceeds of Governor's Guards programs. Monies in the account shall be expended to the Adjutant General for the purposes of facilitating the operations of the Governor's Guards. Governor's Guards Horse Account 
There is established an account to be known as the Governor's Guard's Horse Account, which shall be a separate, non-lapsing account within the general fund. The account shall contain any monies required by law to be deposited into the account, which shall include but not be limited to donations for the specific purpose of offsetting the costs of maintaining Governor's Guard's horses. Money in the account shall be expended by the Adjutant General for the purposes of facilitating the operations of the Governor's Guards. Now what they're forming here are obviously mercenary forces to be used against we the people. Duties of Adjutant General The Adjutant General shall make such returns and reports to such officers as may be prescribed by the United States Department of Defense in regulations pertaining to the National Guard. At such times and in such form as prescribed, the Adjutant General shall keep the service records of all officers and enlisted personnel, issue authorized service medals, ribbons, and documents, generate and maintain all records and documents required by state law or regulations thereunder, and process requests for such records pursuant to the State Freedom of Information Act as pursuant Section 1-200, and generate and maintain all records and documents required by federal law or regulations thereunder, and process requests for such records pursuant to Federal Freedom of Information Act. The Adjutant General is charged in all matters pertaining to the command, discipline, employment, and administration of the Armed Forces of the State with the duty of recording, authenticating, and communicating to members of the Armed Forces of the State all orders, instructions, and regulations issued by order of the Governor or the Adjutant General as the designee of the Governor for the Armed Forces of the State and the, for the Secretary of Defense for the National Guard preparing and distributing commissions, compiling and issuing registers of the Armed Forces of the State, conducting internal audits and investigations, organizing and coordinating the participation of the Armed Forces of the State in military and civic ceremonies, organizing and coordinating inaugurals, and managing recruiting of the Armed Forces of the State. In event of emergency use of the Armed Forces of the State, and with the approval of the Governor, the Adjutant General may serve as the dispersing officer of all funds appropriated by the General Assembly for the expense of the office of the Adjutant General. The Adjutant General may adopt regulations pertaining to the preparation and rendering of reports and returns, the care and preservation of military property, and the administration of military personnel as in the Adjutant General's opinion, the conditions demand such regulations to be operative and enforced when promulgated in the form of general orders, circular and circular letters. The Adjutant General may have charge and care of all state military property and all United States military property issued to the state and shall keep an accurate and careful account of all receipts and issues of the same. The Adjutant General shall keep a record of all public property in the state in the possession of the armed forces of the state and shall grant guard such property against injury and loss to the greatest extent possible. The Adjutant General shall conduct annual inspections of all public property, keep a complete inventory of such property in places where it is deposited. The Adjutant General shall require each accountable and responsible officer of the armed forces of the state to account for any deficiency in public property in such officer's possession upon discovery of such deficiency. The Adjutant General shall require each unit of the armed forces of the state to be inspected at least once each calendar year. The Adjutant General shall annually, as provided in Section 4-60, make a report to the Governor of the Strength, Condition, and Equipment of the Armed Forces of the State and of the expenditure of the office since the last annual report. The Adjutant General may enter into contracts or agreements with any person or agency, public or private, for goods, services, or property necessary for execution of the duties of the Adjutant General's office and operation of the military department, including the permits of federal construction contracting on state property subject to the approval of the Attorney General. Interstate Compacts for Mutual Military Aid with the prior or subsequent consent of the Congress of the United States, the Governor is authorized to enter into, amend, supplement, and implement agreements or compacts with the executive authorities of other states providing for mutual aid and matters incidental thereto in case of invasion or other hostile action, disaster, insurrection, or imminent danger thereof. Such agreements or compacts may include, but shall not be limited to, provisions for joint military action against a common enemy. Notice that. Joint military action against a common enemy. What happens when that common enemy is the people, the human people of the United States? For the protection of bridges, tunnels, ferries, pipelines, communication facilities, and other vital installations, plants and facilities for the military support of civil defense agencies, for the fresh pursuit by the organized military or military forces, 
organized militia or military forces or any part thereof of a signatory into the jurisdiction of any other signatory of persons acting or appearing to act in the interest of an enemy government or seeking or appearing to seek to overthrow the government of the United States or of any signatory for the powers, duties, rights, privileges, and immunities of the members of the organized militia or military forces of any signatory while so engaged outside of their own jurisdiction for such other matters as are of a military nature or incidental thereto and which the governor deems necessary or proper to promote the health, safety, and welfare of the people of the state for the allocation of all costs and expenses arising from the planning and operation of such agreements or compacts. Nothing contained in this section shall be construed to interpret as expressing a limitation directly or indirectly of the power of the governor to enter into and to amend or supplement such compacts with legal force and effect and without the legislation, legislative authorization, authorization expressed herein. Now notice, on its face, all of these things are in direct violation of the constitutional prohibition on standing armies among all of the other articles that are 12 and above, of course, because 13 and below are fraudulent for many different reasons. I covered that in a previous video about what is constitutional. Arrest without warrant, issuance of orders, application of condemned tax. Now here we get into the legal mechanism that they would use to leverage this compact force, shall we call it, against the people. The Commissioner of Weights and Measures, his inspectors, and the Municipal Sealers of Weights and Measures... Now remember, before we get into this, the previous part stated that they would use these military forces of the compact and the states, the standing armies that they are positioning against the Constitution, as law enforcement for the civil law. Right? That's their code. That's not the constitutional law. That is their law. Their, their commercial, their contract, their corporate, and their codified laws, all of the, and their international laws, of course, as we mentioned earlier, there is an implication of international cooperation going on here. Anyway, they would use all this stuff to enforce their unlawful edicts against the people when the people do so choose to try and reinstate the Constitution. One of those things in the Constitution they never want reinstated is a constitutional jury because the constitutional jury would hold them accountable and so they need force, ultimate force, to stop that. Anyway, the Commissioner of Weights and Measures, his inspectors, and the Municipal Sealers of Weights and Measures shall each have power to arrest without warrant right arrest without warrant any violator of the laws relating to weights and measures and to seize without warrant for use as evidence any false or unsealed weight measure or weighing or measuring device or package or amount of any commodity found to be used retained offered or exposed for sale or sold in violation of law the law they're specifying here is not the constitution because what they just stipulated is in direct violation of multiple articles in the Constitution, one of which charges the U.S. Congress with the sole duty of establishing a uniform rule of weights and measures. That means the states are specifically prohibited from meddling in weights and measures. Only the Congress of the U.S. Constitution can specify weights and measures. And the other thing that this is violating, obviously, is the warrant uh, in people being uh, secure in their person's property uh, affects all that stuff. And, of course, the warrant that is issued based off of oath or affirmation. This whole section is violating at least those three articles. The commissioner, his inspectors, and the municipal sealers may also issue stop use, hold, and removal orders with respect to any such weights and measures commercially used and stop sale, hold and removal orders with respect to the weight or measure of any such packaged commodities or bulk commodities kept offered or exposed for sale. Notwithstanding, that is a word, by the way, that is used in the Constitution stating anything to the contrary of the articles of the Constitution. That would be the first 12 and above because everything 13 and below is, in fact, contrary to the earlier amendments. There shall be no ex post facto laws. 
but notwithstanding means it has no standing it has no legitimacy basically so this states notwithstanding any other provision of the general statutes or regulations adopted there under the commissioner and his inspectors may also issue wait i read that violation yeah, no, the commissioner and his inspectors may also issue stop use and hold removal orders with respect to any weights and measures devices found to be defective or otherwise in violations of section 22A-174 or regulations adopted under said section. The commissioner, his inspectors, and the municipal sealers of weights and measures may apply a condemned tag to any false weight measure or weighing or measuring device or to any weighing or measuring instrument or device to which a sealer of weights and measures has attached a seal or tag which has been tampered with, marked, defaced, removed, forged, or counterfeited. Now, finally, we get a distinction between this concept of the unorganized militia and the organized militia. The desire here is to put major force, military force, into the hands of a corrupt few so they can wield it against the people and all in the while convincing the people not to do anything about it because they're operating under the guise of the U.S. Constitution. In their article, Chapter 505, Private Military Forces, this explains their perspective towards the people of the United States and the U.S. Constitution. Private Military Force as used in this chapter includes any group of five or more persons organized or associated together in a camp group organization company association or society or in any other manner for the purpose of drilling or maneuver with firearms or other dangerous weapons or with imitations copies or replicas thereof or for the purpose of giving or acquiring military training or experience but said term private military force shall not include in any military force or police units of the United States or of any state or territory or of any political subdivision of any state or territory or a cadet or reserve corps corps of any institution of learning whose military training is under governmental supervision or any society of war veterans in the course of their authorized activities that word there authorized activities and governmental supervision or any society or fraternal organization which features a uniform or costume with sidearms or replicas, therefore for display purposes only, or the Boy Scouts of America, the Catholic Boys Brigade of the United States, Inc., or troops of a foreign government whose admission to the United States has been consented to by the federal or state government, or any person acting or appearing in any theater, motion picture, or television production while actually engaged in representing therein military and naval characters or scenes. So, according to them, any body of citizens that gather together is a private military force because these people are operating under the guise of wording in the Constitution, but everything that they do is designed to subvert and to supplant the Constitution. So it's one way or the other. Either the people in the armed forces that swear allegiance to the Constitution, either they're traitors for not doing anything about this type of thing, or they're ignorant basically, but that still doesn't mean that they're not in dereliction of duty. But the fact is that if you swear allegiance to the Constitution, there is no there's no middle ground. You, you can't be in allegiance to the Constitution and then enforce these things. You can't. You can't support the Constitution. You can't be on the side of the Constitution if you're enforcing these, these edicts, which are in direct violation of all the articles in the Constitution, at least most of them, if not all of them. Certainly not in violation of the 13 articles and below, though. Those things are in violation of the other 12 and above. Anyway, if you have enjoyed this content, please check out my other publications and like and share it, this video. And there are free books available at the links as well. If you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App. Thank you.